welcome everybody to another enjoy this recording as well and before starting i just request everybody to close their eyes and get a deep breath in and out slowly completely relaxing into every breath and letting go of any tension that is stress or anxiety of the day and inviting you all to connect to bhai baba in your own way from your heart to his feeling his love and blessings into your whole being and surrendering it all to him if it feels light and stay in silence for a few seconds the word feels like slowly gently opening our eyes baba said that the real things are felt in silence or oh, something like that right what is the quote does anyone remember the only thing that is real is felt in silence it's written on the samadhi as well and Bring, yeah Uh, things that are real are given to us. I'm going to tell you. Thank you, Paul. So how is everyone feeling today? <laughs> is there anything you want to share before we start? Great. So today we have Diana with us who's going to start the reading. And uh, last week we read something really beautiful so i'd like to read that again so we will start with page number 1730 eva can you start sharing the screen yeah yeah so just can you make me host yeah sure i'll make you So go to page number one seven three zero, scroll down and yeah scroll up yeah so um dana can you start from this part uh you know the, the part that is highlighted this is bad can you see it? eva can you make it a little more bigger yeah you want me to start um in nasik is that where you want me to start yeah 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 okay thank you okay and and how do i know when to stop uh you stop when you feel comfortable maybe like in a page or two or i can ask you to stop and then i'll ask the next reader to go okay let's yeah. see how far i can last yeah thank you in nasik baba visited dina and naval baba asked naval how he felt seeing dina's worried expression baba gestured this is bad one mustn't hold on to worries no matter how sad or depressing and keep them in the mind all the time brooding over them instead take the worry from your mind fling it out and be free of it by occupying yourself 
and daily chores in your usual routine. Because all this is nothing, zero, illusion. Whatever has happened has happened. It is over, finished, whether it was painful or pleasant. Nothing whatsoever remains of either. Whether it be happiness or misery, both are the same. Neither is lasting. When you were miserable, you were feeling sad. Now that feeling has left you. Similarly, if you had nothing to worry about, you would have been happy. But even that happiness would not have lasted. Of what use would even that happiness have been to you? So whatever misery or happiness is here today, today it will pass. Everything comes, everything goes. But from the spiritual viewpoint, if one bears suffering as much as possible, it is good. Dana asked, but why should there be so much suffering when you are here, present in physical form? Baba replied, it is because I am here that you suffer. Do I not suffer and bear it? So also those who are mine should be prepared to suffer. That evening, Baba and all went to see Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. The following day, during an explanation, Baba stated, if you see Chanji with your gross eyes, you see his figure, no circle, no colors surrounding him. But if you concentrate and can see him through your subtle eyes, you can see his astral form without color or mark, a faint form, a bit blue or grayish. If, however, you have developed mental consciousness and see him through your mental eye, you see him in the form of a circle with seven colors, all blended together in one. This can only be seen by a master. Colors are due to sanskaras created by imagination. Why seven colors? When the first clash between energy and the heavens, or space, prana and akash, took place, it created a spark, a circle, which had seven colors. All such sparks have seven colors. None knows that even before the electron, there is one form in the beginning, but what name to give it? The class of energy and the heavens created this first form. From Nasik, Baba went again to Bombay by train on the 11th of July, accompanied by Chanji, Sidhu, and Melu, Rustam's son. In Bombay, Baba saw his close lovers, including Dina's parents, Rupamai and Hormuzji, leader, and Savak Kotwal. After his extensive, extremely taxing journeys, Plater had returned to Bombay, where he was to meet Baba for the first time after many months. Baba instructed both Plater and Sama Kotwal to search for God-intoxicated musts and mad persons who could be brought to the Rari ashram where he intended to work with them. At one point, Baba handed Savak a mango to eat, and his wife Nergis looked on in hopes of having a bite. But Baba indicated to Savak to eat the whole fruit and not share it with anyone. This made Nergis wonder why. But a year later, when her son Adi was born, she remembered the master's prasad to her husband and knew that it was meant for him to have a son. Well, Bum. While Baba was in Bombay, he visited the residences of the Kutwals, the Dada Chanjis, Chanji's sister Mara at Dadar, and Rustam Diniyar and Carmen Masi. I think I'll take a break now. All right, thank you. Where did you stop, oh, Dana? Eva, do you know where she stopped? Uh, she stopped at the top of 1732 page. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. I'll take over from you.
Jamshed Desai also saw Baba during this visit, as did Alamai Kartrak. Rustam brought a new Pontiac and drove Baba in it to see a film, Shanghai, at the Palace Cinema in Dadar. Mansari was in Bombay at this time, and Baba permitted her to cable her brother, Nino, and his fiance, Bapai, in Nausari, who immediately came to Bombay to meet him. It had been four and a half years since they had seen Baba, and Baba lovingly spent two and a half hours with them on the night of 13th July, from 9 until 11.30. And again, for half an hour, the following morning at 7 a.m. before Baba departed. Leaving ba Bombay, Baba arrived in Merabad via Nasik on 15 July 1936 and stayed for two weeks arranging matters for the move. Baba would go to a movie at Sarosh Talkies with a few of the Mandali at least once a week. On the 18th of July, he did a musical comedy, Strike Me Pink, with Eddie Cantor and Ethel Moorman, that he liked very much. During this period, when Sarosh and his wife, Bilu, came to Merabath to see Baba. Sarosh had married Vilu with Baba's permission, but she had no faith in Baba's divinity. Nonetheless, Baba liked her and privately assured Sarosh that she would eventually come to love him. The couple had been married for almost 10 years, but still had no children. When they visited Merabad, at this time, Baba was sitting with the Mandali and was in such exceptionally good mood that he remarked that he would give a present to each man. To one, he gave a simple handkerchief, to Padri a motorcycle, to Rustam a horse. Baba then turned to Sarosh and gestured, I have given you a gift already. At the time, Vilu did not know she was pregnant, but she soon found out and later bore a son. Thereafter, they had two daughters. Nonetheless, Vilu still lacked faith in Baba. She would occasionally accompany Sarosh to see Baba and respected him as a master. But in her naive, uh, sorry, in her naivete, naivety, she thought that Meher Baba did not have anything to do with things that happen naturally. She, through Sarosh, sorry, the Sarosh continuously stressed that they were in fact Baba's blessings. Padri subscribed to the Illustrated Weekly of India and he was complaining on 26 July about the non delivery of an issue. Baba opened that what is past is past. And one should not cry over spilt milk. Next page. Uh, Marvin, would you like to read from here? No, okay. Eva, would you like to read? Sure. <clears throat> Padre was in an irritated mood already and said, does that apply to you? Baba said, I am above all that. But he was highly displeased by Padre's disrespectful remark. Baba began going to Rahuri frequently to inspect the con construction work. He would visit Nasik also to arrange living accommodations for the Western men and women whom he intended to call to India. The ashram in Rahuri was declared open in August of 1936. 
and the first of the musts and the mad were brought there. This was the beginning of a very important phase of Meher Baba's work with the god Mad, and one which was to occupy a large share of his time for many years. The following description by Meher Baba elucidates what constitutes the mind of a must. All musts are intoxicated with God. They are intoxicated by divine love. When a normal person is intoxicated by alcohol or drugs, he enjoys the sensation so long as the intoxicant is in sufficient concentration in his physical tissues. A drunkard feels happy, cares not for anyone or anything, and has one dominant sensation of drunkenness in which the past, present, or future has practically no meaning. But as soon as the ordinary intoxication passes away, the drunkard suffers the reverse, the hangover. Stimulated physical intoxication is inescapably temporary because it is limited by the very stimulant itself, the conditions of the environment, the cost of the stimulant, and the resilience of one's condition. Now a person who is God intoxicated experiences the same sensation that a drunkard enjoys and cares for no one and nothing in proportion to the extent of his inner intoxication. The vast difference is the must's intoxication is continual that it may increase, but can never decrease, and that it has no harmful physical or mental reaction. It is an inner state of permanent and unalloyed intoxication, independent of anything external. The principal sensation of a must is this permanent enjoyment of divine intoxication. The creation is full of bliss and the must enjoys this bliss and thereby becomes intoxicated to an almost unlimited extent, virtually consuming him and absorbing him and thereby making the world around him vanish. Absorbed in God, such a person is continually absorbed in thinking about God. And with that comes, like a bolt, pure love, consuming him further in a state of divine intoxication. On other occasions, Mayor Bob explained to the Mandali, such persons known as musts, are not insane or mad in the ordinary sense. Musts are desperately in love with God or consumed by their love for God. Musts do not suffer from what may be called a disease. They are in a state of mental disorder because their minds are overcome by such intense spiritual energies that are far too much for them, forcing them to lose contact with the world, shed normal human habits and customs and civilized society and live in a state of spiritual splendor, but physical squalor. They are overcome by an agonizing love for God and are drowned in their ecstasy. Only the divine love embodied in a perfect master can reach them. Another time, Baba further elucidated, how does it happen that some men and women become musts? There are those who have become musts whose minds have become unbalanced through unceasing dwelling 
upon thoughts of God so that they neglect all normal human requirements. There are those whose minds have become unbalanced by sudden contact with the highly advanced spiritual being. There are those who have sought spiritual experience and have met a crisis from which they do not recover. What characterizes all musts is their concentration upon the love of God. Rahuri, a small rural town, lies on the road that links Ahmednagar with Nasik, and it was a convenient place for Baba since his permanent headquarters remained at Meherabad. The town was located near the banks of a tributary of the Godavri River, and plentiful rain made it abound with greenery. The ashram was built in a grove of orange and mango trees, making it a pleasant atmosphere for such work. And footnote. Kukarni Maharaj, an advanced soul who had guided Basni Maharaj to Sai Baba, had resided in Rahuri in the early 1900s. End of footnote. Badul was given the duty of cooking for the Rahuri inmates and the few Mandali who were living there. A hired cook named Laxman cooked for Baba. Baidul was also to help look after the mad and musts. Pleader, who had come from Bombay at the end of July, and Rao Sahib were appointed supervisors. Pleader, Kakabaria, Savak, Katwal, and Homi Arani were directed to travel about and bring musts and mad persons from different places. And footnote, Homi Arani was Carmen Masi's son and had been a student in Meher Ashram. Along with his two brothers, he was now helping in Baba's work. At this time, Dahak was practicing attorney and Rahuri and visited the ashram often to manage the office affairs and sometimes stayed there. A dispensary run by Dr. Nilu was later opened in Rahuri with Jab Jalbai as his assistant. Besides helping supervise the dispensary, Jalbai managed the office in Dahak's absence. Masaji Gustaji Ghani and Bao Chima, a Meher Ashram boy, were also residents of the Rahuri Ashram, as was Tai Bali. The remaining men, Mandali, consisting of Adi Senior, Chagan, Kalimama, Kalangad, Padri, Pendu, Situ, and Vishnu, stayed at Meherabad while the women Mandali were living on the hill. Thank Just, you, Eva. You're welcome. Mahu, would you like to read this for the second part of discussions on creating? Yes. Thanks. Sure. Uh, this is page 1735 in the year 1936. Baba's working in India. Masaji, Kustaji, Ghani, and... Oh, just from the second para, discussions on creating... Oh, I'm a... sorry. Sure. Yeah, that... Discussions yeah. on creating a trust were ongoing. And on 6 August, Baba stressed the importance to his four pillars of Merabad, Adi Senior, Hindu, Padri, and Vishnu, to carefully review the draft of the clauses of the proposed trust document. He also emphasized the, the need for economic, economizing on expenses. On 15 August 1936, Meher Baba executed a trust 
need the, a trust deed in NASEC creating the Meher Mandeli Maintenance Trust. A board of trustees was appointed to see to the management of the NASEC, Rahuri, and Merabad ashrams and to ensure maintenance of individuals and families dependent upon Meher Baba. The idea in creating a trust was initially to free Baba from overseeing the details of the ashrams daily affairs so he could concentrate on his work with the mad and masks in Rahuri. But Baba still kept a close watch over all the activities and personally intervened when necessary and there is a footnote. Another reason for forming the trust was because of persons such as K.J. Dastur, who wrote to Bob Meher Baba asking for money. With the creation of the trust, Baba could reply that all financial matters were out of his hands. End of footnote. Yeah. There were eight original trustees, Adi Senior, Kaka, Hadri, Pendu, Ramju, Sarosh, Vishnu, and Nurina. Adi was the president of the board, Pendu and Nurina vice presidents, and Vishnu the secretary. The trustees were to hold a meeting the first week of every month. Their first was held on Sunday, 16 August in Nasek. Baba had agreed to be present for the engagement ceremony between two young devotees from Napsari, Minu Desai, Mansari's brother, and his cousin, and his cousin ba Bapai, 27. They came to Nasek for the ceremony, which was performed on the 16th. Baba himself put the ring on mm, Bapai's finger as she wept. Age was touched by Baba's gesture. Quote, the creator of the universe besides his universal work is attentive to each of his lovers. To create thirst for truth, he personally attends to every individual and collective matter. Next page, page 1736 now. Baba went back to Rahuri the following day and began staying in a small one-room hut built for him there. He resided in Rahuri for most of the next three months until October. He would sometimes sit in seclusion with one of the mad or advanced souls. And there's a picture of Baba in uh, Rahuri. It's titled at Rahuri and he's sitting under a tent. From September 1936, Baba began visiting Nasser every Wednesday to make, certain, to make certain that matters were going smoothly in the work of preparing for the Westerners' arrival. He would return to Rahuri in the evenings. On Thursdays, he would visit Merabad to see the woman Mandeli, again returning to Rahuri in the evenings. Sometimes he rose at 3 a.m and left Rahuri for Merabad at 4.30 a.m. There were a few genuine God-intoxicated God masks and a few God-mad in the Rahuri ashram, but for the most part, the inmates were mad, mentally disturbed, or retarded men found in the towns and villages of the surrounding areas with nothing spiritual about them. 
the inmates were given every freedom except that of stepping outside the extensive limits of the ashram grounds. God intoxicated or wholly mad, the behavior of the inmates was found to be truly abnormal. One mast named Dagdu, Dagdu Bull, left to be called Bao, means brother. If called by, the, by that name, he would uh, shrug his shoulders, cut his chest, and beam with happiness. At times, Dagdu Bao would climb up one of the large trees in the compound and sit clinging to an uppermost branch for four or five hours at a time. Another strange mass who had no name was brought from Bombay for a short time. He would smear his entire body with ash and lime. Although this God intoxicated man was not identified, he was the first mass to be baited by Baba here. One mast named Lal Saheb would fall at Baba's feet and embrace him with fervor. He would address Baba as God. Lal Saheb was friends with a half wit named uh, Punjia, who was one of the most amusing and lovable characters in the ashram. Lal Saheb would promise Punjia that he would bring him a wagon full of gold, jewels, and treasures, and would have him married to a rich Maharaja, Maharaja's daughter. Lal would keep his hand in his pocket, saying he had a crore of rupees that means 10 million in it, and would ask Punjia whether he should pull out the money and give it all to him. <laughs> Punjia would answer, no, not yet. Even though Punjia acted, acted childish or silly and was nicknamed Goofy, he was a splendid company and became the life of the ashram. Thank you, Mahu. Uh, Vijayji, if you're there and you can read, maybe you try to read next. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Uh, Eva, just make the text a little uh, bigger, no? Thanks. Okay. Uh, film you. projects and work in India. He was given to hilarious laughter at the slightest provocation. He loved rhythm of sound and body and was seldom seen without a kerosene pen can around his neck, which he would play like a percussion instrument, tapping out a sequence of sounds to whomsoever accompaniment. He would fling himself into fanciful dances. Punjia was so fond of his improvised tin drum that any lapse of his behavior could be corrected by threatening to confiscate it. At times mischievous, Punjia once clipped the hair of a musk named Jama Sahib from four o'clock each morning, Baba gave himself to tending these derelicts. He would wash their faces, shave them, cut their hair, clean their latrines, serve them breakfast, and often feed them by hand, and frequently take them 
in his embrace and kiss them he even arranged musical entertainment for them hiring babu gavai of pune to reside in rahuri and sing before them each day at a salary of 30 per month when babu would sing kunjia would beat the rhythm on his kerosene tin as another inmate would dance Rahuri was a strange and wonderful ashram age related where the worldly mad were kept with the intoxicated lovers of god demonstrating to ben kind how the lord of the universe becomes a companion to his lovers and serves them the splendor of bhavas work with the mad and was in this age will provide a source of inspiration to humanity for all time to come age was watched as the drunken must of the ashram were in their intoxication and were playful with the beloved and it saw the master satisfy their every whim what a unique play of the wine what leela the intoxicated were unaware of the game they were absorbed in their intoxication and the tavern keeper was serving them more and more wine to make them totally unconscious of the world so that one day they would be prepared to become completely conscious of reality what delirium the mass causes thought age no consciousness of the body of the world but is still conscious of the pain which longs to be one with the beloved the wine creates the fire of longing and burns those who drink it this is the real reason why the lord of compassion was the companion and servant of his true lovers and why the served them with such total dedication and love mehar babas must were continued for the next 22 years until 1958 for a full account of his must work see william donkins book the way fairers shall i continue yeah if you like to Savak Kaka Bariya and Homi brought an old Punjabi mass from Bombay on 20th December uh, September 1936 who they found sitting in a garden opposite VT station Pleader and Chanji brought two maid person from Bombay on the 27th along with a Bengali mass and fakir bua Jama ji who baba informed them was mad one night at rahuri rao sai was on duty sitting outside baba's quarters baba had ordered him not to allow anyone to enter but after some hours rao sai had left his post momentarily to ease his bladder just then ghani who had been away for a few days came to report his arrival to baba Gani walked into Baba's room, not knowing that Baba was working. He was stunned when he saw Baba's pained expression. Baba began trembling violently for several minutes. Gani later described, "Baba looked more ghastly than I have ever seen him before." Baba was furious. He scolded both Rao Sahib and Gani and explained, "When I was interrupted while I was doing my universal work, I took the entire shock of it on myself. Otherwise, Gani would have been killed instantly." Uh, <clears throat> around this time rao sahib became so ill on 2nd october 1936 vishnu had to take him to ahmednagar for treatment 
Ghani left the same day for Bombay to purchase construction material. Kleda returned to Rahuria on the 4th, accompanied by a Kaikovar, with two more inmates. Bauer told Kleda that he would be benefited tremendously by the work Baba had assigned him of bringing masks and made for the Rahuri ashram. Do your duty consciously, conscience, conscientiously, Baba told him. You will get what you want in this life. Conscious experience of God, not like a mazoo. Oh. And it may come at any moment. Baba also mentioned Piku Baba, the children of Bombay, whom Baba had met as a young man. Piku Baba is a special case in a special state because although he is on the sixth plane and has the same experience as a realized soul, he is not yet one with God. <clears throat> Just I would like to mention it here, when Baba said, not like a mazu, you will mean, uh, you will see the conscious experience of God, his life, means that's important. Uh, once Baba told my father also, don't be like a mazu, but uh, uh, be in the world. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, Pifu Baba is a special case in a special state because although he is on the sixth plane and has the same experience as a realized soul, he is not yet one with God. One of the uh -huh. One of the new inmates pleader had recently brought from Bombay was a genuinely advanced soul named Tukaram El Chawan. He was known as Muhammad Mast and became one of Meher Baba's favorites. Muhammad Mast eventually advanced to the fifth plane, but when he first arrived at Rahuri as a young man, in his early 20s, Baba said he was caught in a dangerous, enchanted state between the third and fourth planes. Kalingad was shifted to Rahuri in mid-October to help Gani with the Tata matting work of constructing quarters for the inmates and to help supervise the construction of a small cabin for Baba. Thank you so much, Vijayji. Uh, Ralph, would you like to read next? Okay. Baba went uh, film projects and work in India? That's different than what we've been reading, correct? No, just uh, yo, Baba went to Nasik. Okay. Baba went to Nasik for the day on the morning of 7th October by car with Adi Senior, Chanji, Adi Junior, and Jalbai. Yeah. Jalbai, in this case, is Baba's brother. Is that right, you think? Jal, didn't they call him Jalbai? Anyone know? Oh, this is recorded. Sorry. I'm sure it is. Uh, Chanji went on to Bombay to make inquiries about tickets and... Uh, routes as Baba was planning a brief trip to the West. Two days later, Rustam, Ramju and Adi Sr. 
were summoned to Rahuri for a meeting with Baba and arrived late at night on the 9th. Baba was driven to Maribad the following morning with Adi Sr. Chanji and Jalbai for a meeting of all the trustees. A discussion took place about the arrival of the Westerners. An argument ensued about what type of food to arrange, and it was finally decided to serve only vegetarian fare, to make arrangements for their housing. Baba had been to Nasik and instructed Rustam and Franey about the specifics of this and other matters. The house and 22 acre property that had been acquired in Nasik was called Meher Retreat. Rustam and his family stayed at the large main bungalow. At first, while a small guest cottage was constructed or renovated, a separate building with 12 rooms was built, was being built on Rustam's property to accommodate the Westerners. On Sunday, 18th October, 1936, Adi Sr. drove Baba to Bombay from where on the 20th at 9 p.m., accompanied by only Kaka and Chanji, Baba boarded the Kathiawar mail railroad train for Karachi. Hindu hyphen Muslim communal riots that left 60 dead and 500 injured coincided with Baba's presence in Bombay reaching Karachi two days later, Baba met Pilamai and her family and his maternal aunt, Banu, Banu Masi and her family. Baba and the Mandali left Karachi on the 24th. Baba and the Mandali left Karachi on the 24th. On the 24th seat, Imperial Airways, uh, hard, hard, Hadrian biplane. There's a footnote there. While you're reading it, I need to get my glasses. J hey, Bob. Imperial Airways was Britain's main international airline between 1924 and 1939. It enjoyed semi-official status as it was subsidized by the British government and had the contract to deliver air mail throughout the empire. Source, internet website, and a footnote. Thanks. Eva, just make this uh, text a little uh, bigger, please. Zoom oh. in a bit. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. It was uh, the ninth foreign journey. Baba's first international air travel proved distressing for Kaka and Chanji, who suffered from headaches and vomited during the flight. Due to the severe turbulence from Bahrain to Basra, arriving in Baghdad 
on the evening of Sunday. The 25th October, Baba and the Mondali checked into a hotel. The next day, they took a tour of Bombay, no, of Baghdad. On the 27th, Baba visited the shrine of Hazrat, Ab, Hazrat Abdul Qadir Gilani. Hazrat Abdul Qadir Gilani. Also spelled a different way. A Sufi perfect master of his time. Footnote. Go on, it's not important. Okay. Baba remained in the Muslim tomb for some time, but made no comment on his work. News was given to them of the Baghdad train station that there was a breach on the railway line at the crossing of the Turkish border with no definite information as to when the line would be repaired and ready for travel. This report was at first vexing because Baba had planned to proceed to England from Iraq by train. Baba also was also feeling ill. His eyes had become swollen and he had severe pain in his molar teeth. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, um, Say Baba. Marvin, could you read now? Thank you. In, in spite of his failing health, on the 27th, Baba arranged for a large amount of cooked food to be purchased and fed 100 of the city's beggars, serving the food with his own hands. <clears throat> At one point, he remarked, by my coming here, the link with Wahuri is snapped. And to reestablish this link, I am feeding these poor persons. Before starting their journey, Bob had expressed his desire to feed and if possible, bathe a number of poor and crippled persons in Baghdad. Now, due to being detained by the breach in the railway line, he was able to do his work with the destitute. Bob's health had become so serious that he considered canceling his planned visit to England and sending for Kitty Davy from London to convey to her all the instructions for his lovers there. Telegrams were exchanged with the Western group, but Baba then dismissed that idea and decided to proceed to London, although his stay was to be drastically curtailed to only three days. Baba left Baghdad by the Taurus Express train on Wednesday, 28 October, 1936, at nine that evening. From Kirkuk, he went to Mosul by taxi and then on to Tel Kach Kachak by train. While traveling, Chanji would read aloud the manuscript of Baba's biography, The Perfect Master, recently completed by Charles Purdom. They also discussed Baba's schedule in London. At one point, Shanji read out this quote from the manuscript given by Baba in 1927. The worries and troubles of the world are all due to, quote, thinking, unquote. Soon I shall take this thinking upon myself when my health will most probably be seriously affected. This is essential for my future working, which will affect the whole world. Footnote. Oh, that's from the book, The Perfect Master. Okay. Baba commented, that time referred to is now. My health is suffering so much. Baba was eating only one meal a day of bread, butter, and cheese, and his health was obviously worsening. He complained that his molars caused, continued to cause him much pain, 
and he developed a boil on the tip of his nose. Traveling through Turkey, the train stopped at Konya. A few miles from the station is the tomb of one of Babit's favorite poets, Molana Rumi. Konya is a sacred place to Sufis because it is where Rumi resided. Although Baba did not visit Rumi's shrine, no doubt it is significant that he passed so close to it. Another footnote. Jalal al-Din al-Rumi, called Mal Abi, 1207 and 1273, was the founder of the Sufi order known as Whirling Dervishes, whose ecstatic dances would produce visions and higher states of spiritual consciousness. Born in Afghanistan, Rumi became a great Islamic scholar and traveled throughout Persia, settling in Konya, where he was revered both as a religious scholar and poet. <clears throat> in 1244, he came under the influence of Shamsi Tabriz, an itinerant, itinerant Sufi dervish and a kutub of his time. The divine knowledge, Gnosis, that Shams possessed was evidently greater than all of Rumi's book writing and learning. Rumi gave up his books and became Shams' favorite disciple. Later, he began writing again, and many of his poetical works of lyrical odes are dedicated to or named after his master, Shams. Reaching Istanbul, Baba and the Mandali boarded the Orient Express on the 31st at 9.45 p.m. for Paris where they arrived on Tuesday, November 3rd, 1936. After a brief rest, they left Paris and arrived in London the following day, whereupon Baba and the Mandali resided once again at Hygieia House. In London, Baba granted separate interviews to Kitty, her older sister, May Cluse, Minta Toledano, Margaret Cresp, Mabel Ryan, Ilya de Leon, Christine McNaughton, Will and Mary Beckett, Tom Sharpley, Quentin Todd, and Charles Purdon. In a similar manner, he met in private with his American lovers who had come to London. Footnote. The American group traveled together from New York on a French ship, landed in Plymouth on November 4th, 36. Marina, Elizabeth, Noni, and Rano, Sam Cohn, and Malcolm and Jean Schloss. Three others, John Bass, Kenneth Ross, and Edith Duro, also met with him, but Baba decided not to allow them to come to India, directing them instead to return to America. The rest of his Western lovers, Baba explained in detail about their forthcoming stay in Meher Retreat in Nasik. He fixed the date of their traveling to India as a month from then in December. After the interviews were over, Baba and the group went to see the movie, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, starring Gary Cooper. Baba was impressed with the film and remarked that it was an outstanding example of how motion pictures can be produced and used for the upliftment of mankind's consciousness while at the same time providing entertainment. It was exactly this topic which Baba discussed with another newcomer, Alexander Markey, 45, who met Baba for the first time during this brief visit to London. Xander, nicknamed Markey, was an American writer and director of stage and film, a colorful impresario, is how one critic described him. Many screenwriters had been contacted to work on the scripts for Baba's film projects, and when Markey's name was cabled to Baba by Narina and Elizabeth, who had contacted him in New York, Baba had cabled back Marky is the man. Therefore, the search for other writers ceased, and Bob accepted Marky's treatment of the material. Marky was working on the screen adaptation of Carl Vollmuller's story, This Man David, after Mercedes de Acosta had written a synopsis. Footnote. A year later, the, through a friend of Garrett Fort's, Marky's finished script was given to the famous director Cecil B. DeMille to read. There is no record of Mr. DeMille's reaction. Strange circumstances preceded their meeting. Markey had been invited to London in November of 1936 to supervise the production of a commercial Hollywood film, 
But at that time, it seemed impossible because he was so involved with other work in America. But circumstances so arranged themselves that he was suddenly free to accept the job in London and a few days later left. However, soon after arriving in London, the Hollywood project mysteriously fell through. It was only when Markey received the message that Meher Baba had arrived in London and wished to meet with him that he understood the rapid development of circumstances in his life, which had brought him so unexpectedly to London. Meeting Baba at Hygieia House, Marky felt like a bewildered child, wholly at a loss to know how to behave, what to do, or what to say. When he was ushered into Baba's room, he found himself in the presence of the most sublime embodiment of purity in human form I have ever beheld, quote unquote. He knew and experienced having at last met the one for whom he had been searching. During the master's most recent visits to Europe and America, it seemed he was not as concerned to meet new people as he once had been. Kitty and some of the others who were always eager to introduce new people to Baba, to Baba. Bob, Kitty would even try to get them to sit next to Baba in the car or at a movie, which did not always please Baba. Baba once remarked to her, I will draw the whole world to me when the time is right and when I want. On one occasion, Baba went to have tea at the apartment of one of the English group. After a while, suddenly his face took on a grave, serious look as if he were in tremendous pain. When the atmosphere calmed, Baba explained, if you knew the agony which thousands are undergoing this moment in Spain, you would understand my pain. Civil war was raging in Spain at the time. Unknown to most present, before coming to Europe, Baba had cabled the person in America entrusted with keeping his mysterious secret book to bring it to London. This was done in absolute privacy, and the book, along with some charts and other material illustrating the creation and progress of consciousness through evolution and involution, was handed over to Baba. And a footnote says, Mayor Baba's book, actual handwritten pages of short points, was then brought back to India and given to Ramju. So Roche and Kakabaria's care to Ramju, Sarosh and Kakabaria's care, with instructions that it be kept in a safe deposit box under their names at the Central Bank of India in Bombay. The book remained there for the next 21 years before it disappeared in 1958. November 6 was Baba's last day in London before going to Zurich. Baba gave final instructions to individuals and he and a group left for Victoria train station. Kitty and Margaret had brought him small bundles of violets, which Baba lovingly distributed to each as a parting token of his love. And I can pass the reading now. Would somebody else uh, wish to read now? Thanks, uh, Marvin. Eva, would you like to take it up for me? Sure. Baba, Kaka, and Shanshi were accompanied on this trip by Norena, Elizabeth, Margaret, and Kitty. The following day, they arrived in Zurich where Baba met Hadi and Walter Mertens and their children. Anita Dikara was living with the Mertens family and studying art at Otto Haas Hayes School. On this occasion, Baba instructed her to go to Paris to continue her studies for three months and await his call to come to India. Baba visited Walter's brother's house and met those gathered there. After a while, Baba remarked, someone I was expecting has not come. Now I'll have to come back again to the West. He was referring to a young Swiss woman named Irene Billow, 
whose rendezvous with the divine beloved was soon approaching. Irene knew of Baba, but felt too scared to come and meet him. She naively thought she was not pure enough, which Baba, of course, would know. She had secretly gone to a restaurant nearby with friends, but then cried all night at the opportunity missed. After two days in Zurich, Baba and the group took a train back to Paris on Sunday, 8 November, 1936, and met Ruano there. She too was informed about coming to India and was to make plans accordingly. Baba and the group were driven half an hour away outside of Paris to spend the night at a large late 17th century estate, Chateau de Galoui, near the village of the same name. The property belonged to Madame Gana Walska, 49, a wealthy Polish-born opera singer and friend of Norina's who had not met Baba previously. And footnote, Gana Walska had first met Norina in New York and seen her on stage at the, in The Miracle. Coincidentally, 20 years later, Walska herself appeared in a revival of the play. The country house was magnificent and its garden and grounds beautiful. Baba met a small group of a dozen people after a lavish meal, he was shown to his bedroom. It was winter and the bedroom was an unused one. Blasts of frigid air seeped in through the windows and Baba was unable to sleep. He later complained about it bitterly. The next morning, a photograph of the group was taken and Ghana gave Baba a tour of the main house and guest room, guest house. They admired all the many art treasures. And when they came to one painted portrait of an aristocrat or an ancestor, Ghana proudly exclaimed to Baba, perhaps facetiously, that is my master. Elizabeth was mortified. Norina was quite embarrassed because she had been determined to bring this well-known aristocratic woman and others of her class to Baba. But since their inner connection was not deeply established, she really succeeded. At one point, however, Ghana did express some interest in coming to India for a stay in the ashram. In truth, Ganawalska had never believed in Baba. Oops. But she did. She did respect him and felt the privilege of hosting Baba. Traveling from India to stay in the West less than 10 days, she later wrote. Why should Baba spend one night and a half of his time in France? to sanctify Galiwi with this presence. But the master and his disciples were hard to fathom and to please for someone with limited faith and understanding like Ghana, as can be seen from these passages from her memoirs. Hi, Owing to Baba's extreme wrestling. I'll take it from you, thanks. Okay. Owing to Baba's extreme restlessness, more than curious for a mystic, and to the fact that as hostess, I had much of the actual work to do to make 14 people comfortable during the overnight stay. I could not register my thoughts and I did not allow my feelings to interfere with the 
housewife work. I was busy every second running from the kitchen to Baba's disciples, from the garage to the housekeeper who complained that our cook had lost her head while my secretary in the meantime was suspended on the telephone for the master's orders. With this rush, nervousness, lack of serenity, I could not help having the clear impression that Baba was an ex exceptionally, exceptionally capricious prima donna and his disciples were playing the part of the typical enslaved accompanist, secretary and maids. While Norina Nachabelli acted the role of the Italian, all were extremely excited and scarred, sorry, scared to death of displeading Baba. They waited at his door like a dog sitting on the floor, on the stairs in order to respond more quickly at his call. And when a call came, they rushed so quickly in military style that I trembled for any of my antiques that might be in their way. Hardly had they started breakfast with a half consumed piece of toast in their mouths. They rushed to answer their master. The brioches actually had to be warm six times. They got a chance to finish their coffee. The luncheon hour was changed eight times. The first order having been for one o'clock, but we ate at half past 11. And for this reason, the food was scarcely up to Galois standards. So my chef could not possibly have prepared this complicated vegetarian menu with her usual finesse at an hour's notice. The last change of time having come through just after 11 o'clock and the cause of all this trouble was that Baba wanted to go to the movies to see his favorite entertainment, a gay musical comedy picturing the life of Florence Zegfield, the great Zegfield. After Baba left at midnight, when I finally got to my room, I stayed there for three long days to reciprocate from that hectic, unhealthy, under the note, whip holy life. The day after the departure, when my headache had died away, I thought that God's presence, God's love in our heart and in our home should bring peace and serenity and not fear, panic, the feeling of hurry or physical diseases. Had I not seen Baba, I would not have lost my spiritual, mental and physical forces for several days. But even under those circumstances, I did not wish to judge, especially as Baba's kindness to me was great. Footnote. Kana Walska, always room at the top. R.R. Smith, 1943, page 377. Kana Walska emigrated to America soon after Baba's stay and purchased a 37-acre property in California, intending to establish a spiritual retreat for Tibetan studies. Instead, Walska converted the estate into a public gardens called... I can't see. Eva, can you read that? Yeah, um, called okay. Lotus Land. Yeah. During World War II, the Gallius estate was taken over by the Germans and used as their headquarters. Later, it became an orphanage. It was torn down in 1983 after years of neglect. Baba left Gallius at 10 p.m. The staff was summoned to bid him farewell 
one of them, perhaps Ghana's companion housekeeper or private secretary, could not control his tears. Baba spent that night at Alfredo and Consello Sides' apartment in Paris. The Sides had come to Galias and were also well to do, and unlike Ghana Walska, they became two of Baba's main contacts in Paris. Eva, could you read the footnote? Thanks. Yes. Alfredo, 54, a Frenchman, was a prominent art dealer. Consuelo, 34, an American, had worked with Mercedes de Acosta in New York in 1920 on a musical called What's Next? And a footnote. Thanks. In the early morning of 10 November, after meeting a few new persons, Baba left Paris and arrived in Marcellus at 10 a.m. He and the group checked into the hotel terminus, Baba staying in room 303 and the others in room 304 and 305. Baba had been particularly anxious to reach Marcellus as he stated he had a spiritual appointment to keep. As soon as they arrived, instead of unpacking, Baba asked to be taken to the city park. When they arrived, he began walking back and forth on a gravel path with Norina and Elizabeth on either side of them. A young French man was sitting on a park bench on the other side of a small lawn. Baba eventually strolled around the lawn, walking directly past the young man and stood up and bowed his head in a reverential way to Baba. As he passed, Baba then walked away explaining that the young man was one of his borrowed spiritual agents working for him on the inner planes. And um, yeah, uh, I think we'll end the reading here today. Uh, so I think uh, even it's page 1745, right? That Correct, yeah. All right. And uh, we can have a small chat uh, or a discussion. And yeah, if anybody would like to share anything, we could do that. And you all can unmute yourselves. And thank you so much, everybody. I wonder where that manuscript went that was in the safe deposit box. Did everybody. Did I'm sorry? Did we stop the recording?